Indeed, the power of the cross is something we can never forget. We need to continually remind ourselves of. This world tries to flaunt its own power. Governments, world leaders, militaries, companies, everyone is trying for power in some way. But the true power, the only ultimate power in this world and this universe is found in Jesus Christ. And we gather like we do every week to remind ourselves of truth such as that. As we come to God's word this morning, let's bow together in a word of prayer asking for the Lord's grace upon our time. We ask, Father, that you would please be with us during this time as we seek to open your word, understand what it says for us, and I pray that your spirit would teach us that which we do not know that you would convict us of that which we have sinned and that you would show us that which we need to grow in. And Father, I ask that you would to delight in Christ, in Christ alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if someone were to ask you what religion you are, What would you say? How would you self-identify your faith commitment? Many church-going people today, I would imagine, would instinctively say, oh, I'm a Christian. Others may say, I'm a believer. Others may may answer with, I'm a follower of Jesus or I'm a disciple of Jesus. And still others may choose a denominational affiliation. I'm Baptist. I'm Methodist. Something of the sort. Now, if we were to ask that kind of question of the people in the Bible, particularly of the Apostle Paul, what would he say? What would the Apostle Paul say if he were asked, what religion are you? What label would he take to himself? I want to suggest to you this morning that if asked such a question, that Paul may have answered by saying, I am in Christ. I am in Christ. I believe that the fundamental way to how Paul viewed the Christian life was one that he saw himself as in Jesus Christ and united to him by faith. Now why do I say this? It's because in Paul's writings, in his letters, his epistles that he wrote, the phrase in Christ or in the Lord, or in Him, is found 164 times. This designation that Paul used is shorthand for Paul speaking about a doctrine, a doctrine known as union with Christ. Union with Christ. And so I believe union with with Christ was at the forefront of Paul's mind when it came to describing the Christian life. But we have to ask ourselves, why is something that seems to be so dominant in the Apostle Paul's language and words and writings seems to be talked about so little among Christians? Why do we seem to know so much about other doctrines and yet seem to know so little about union with Christ? I mean, if we're to ask, do you know what salvation is and can you explain that? Check. We can, we can give you some definition of salvation. Or maybe some of the other doctrines. Election. Predestination. Justification. Sanctification. But union with Christ? Well, yeah, it means we're united to Christ, right? And kind of where sometimes our definition can begin and end. But what I want you to see this morning is that union with Christ is not just some other add-on doctrine, but union with Christ is really the bucket by which all the other doctrines that are found in salvation are housed. Authors Joel Beakey and Paul Smalley call the union with Christ the summary grace that undergirds all others. All the other graces in the Christian life What girds them all together, the summary one that ties them all in a bow, is union with Christ. Seems kind of important. Sinclair Ferguson describes it as the link going 
uh, it should probably be bringing, the link, bringing all the other doctrines together in one harmonious whole. This doctrine that brings together all the other doctrines into one harmonious whole, union with Christ. Beaky and Smalley again say this, they say union with Christ is not one portion of the bridge by which God brings many sons to glory, but the entire structure that underlies every step of the application of salvation, as John Murray said. This is the entire bridge, union with Christ. This is the whole bucket. This is the thing that brings together all the other doctrines. So, we can often spend so much time on all these other aspects of theology and we miss this great summary doctrine that pulls them all together. And to do this, to study all these other doctrines, to open up our systematic theology and, and go through all the different categories and yet to miss this one that binds them all together is like going through a museum in which you're looking at all these significant exhibits and you're wowed and awed by all of them and yet you miss the very museum that it's housed in and the magnificent, stunning architecture, the exhibit really, that that museum itself is. And so before we go any further this morning, let me try to explain by what is meant by union with Christ. Union with Christ as it sounds, describes a oneness between Christ and his people, a unity between Jesus and the church. It's, a, it's a, an established bond, a fusing together of Jesus and his people. This bond is indissoluble and indestructible. It's the permanent joining of the Son of God to the covenant people of God by the Spirit of God. Let me say that last sentence again. It's the permanent joining of the Son of God to the covenant people of God by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit takes us as believers and joins us with Jesus. John Calvin says the Holy Spirit is the bond by which Christ effectually unites us to himself. The Holy Spirit is that bond that takes Jesus and takes us and brings us together. It's as if we as Christians have been spiritually fused together with Jesus so that what happens to him is credited to us. We have been so united to him that it can be said that we are in him. Hence the phrase, in Christ. In one sense, this uniting together with Christ, this fusing together, took place in eternity past. Before time even began. In another sense, this uniting to Christ for each one of us took place at the moment of our conversion. Without being united to Christ, you would not be saved. And Jesus could have still died on the cross 2,000 years ago, but if you're not united to Jesus, that death means nothing to you. It's important that we understand this crucial doctrine and how it fits in the fabric of salvation. And so I want to begin by showing you some scriptures where this doctrine is found. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1 in your personal copy of God's Word. If you don't have a Bible with you, you we have some provided for you in the pew rack directly in front of you. These the passages which teach this are all over the New Testament. We're only going to spend some time this morning on some where they're highly concentrated, showing this idea of union with Christ. And Ephesians chapter 1 is a 
center of gravity for this doctrine, for seeing these truths come through loud and clear. Follow, let me, let me read verses 3 through 6 to, to begin. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Now I realize I read more than verse 6, like I said. Uh, but just look up with me back to verse 3. And what we're looking for particularly is these, this phrase, in Him, that comes through so loud and clear in this passage. It says, blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The God and Father is first person of the Trinity. Of, he's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who's blessed us in Christ. There's the first indication. In Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. This is, in one sense, the verse that tells us that this Doctrine of being in Christ is this summary doctrine that undergirds and binds all the other doctrines together. Because you notice that Paul says that every spiritual blessing that you and I receive as Christians is found because we are united to Jesus Christ. It's in Him that we receive these blessings. And then he goes on through this passage to recount those blessings. Verse 4, we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. This is what I meant when I said that in one sense we were united to Jesus before time began. Because we're chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Verse 5, it says that he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. It was through Jesus that we were adopted. Verse 6 it says that there's glorious grace that we have been blessed with. And what is the sphere or location of this blessing of grace? End of verse 6 says, in the beloved. ESV has it capitalized. Who's the beloved? It's Christ. It's in Christ the beloved. That we have received this glorious grace. Verse 7 in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Where do we find the redemption? Where do we find forgiveness for our sins and our trespasses? It's in Him and only in Him. Verse 11, scan down to there. In Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. In Him we've obtained an inheritance. Verse 12, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. Our hope is in Christ. And finally, verse 13. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. In Christ... You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Friends, verse 3 to verse 14 is all one sentence in the Greek. The Apostle Paul was recounting and spilling out all of the recounting of the blessings that we have in Christ and emphasizing that they are all found in Christ because we are united to Him. So these verses describe this in him language, and you'll see this throughout, particularly Paul's writings, but there's another way that this union with Christ is expressed. It's not only with the in Christ language, but it's also the with language. And we'll see this in chapter 2. In fact, the passage that Pastor Taylor preached on the last uh, a couple weeks in July, he covered this passage, and particularly if we pick up in verse 4, after recounting verses 1 through 3, 
our sinful nature without Christ. Verse 4 says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we are dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Did you pick up that first with language there? It says, God, the subject, made us alive together with Christ. Again, this indication of with Christ is a, is a signal that Paul is, is thinking on and is expounding this doctrine of union with Christ. It's with Jesus that we were made alive. Pick up all the other ways, all the other times that Paul says with Christ or with him through this passage. Verse 6, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. All of this is in Christ as we have been united and fused together with Jesus. We were made alive together with him. We were raised up with him. We were seated with him in the heavenly places. All of these benefits, all of these things that have happened have only happened because of our union with the Son of God. Paul makes that explicitly clear. Let's look at one more passage that shows this connection in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. A couple books to the right. We'll pick up in verse, uh, let's pick up in verse 8. Actually, let's pick up in verse 6. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk, what is it? In Him. Rooted and built up in Him. And established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Now pause right there. What we see in these verses is a present exhortation for you and I as believers to live out our union in Christ. He's going to go on, as we'll see, and talk about the historical reality of us being united to Jesus. But here he's talking about the imperative upon our lives to live out that union. He says that we're to walk in him, live according to that union, be rooted and built up in him. Don't be rooted and built up anywhere else, but in him. So there's a, in one sense, a historical reality to our union with Christ, and then there's a present imperative upon our lives to live out that union, and we see that even here. Let's go on. Verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to, the, to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Verse 9. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside and nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. These are just a sampling of passages where these, these, this language of union with Christ is highly clustered. So you can see the theme. And as you can see, this is the Apostle Paul. It's coming through very clearly in his writings and in his uh, teachings. But this isn't the only place that you'll find it. You'll see it in other places. For example, these verses may be familiar to you. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. For I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 
The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Or take Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The doctrine of union with Christ is all over the New Testament. And as these authors have said, it undergirds and pulls together all of these doctrines. It's the center of our spiritual reality. Your union with Jesus is the center of your spiritual life. It's by being united in him and fused to him that we have all that we have in salvation. Union with Christ is the root from which all of our blessings grow. It's the spring from which the river gets its source. You can't speak of all the blessings, all the things that we enjoy, forgiveness and eternal life and, and, and fellowship with God. All those things come because we're united to Jesus. And yet I believe that too often we talk about salvation in a way that, while it being Christ-centered, puts too much distance between us and Christ. You see, we talk about Jesus being over there accomplishing salvation for us. He, he's that guy who 2,000 years ago died upon the cross for our sins and somehow I benefit and it's great. But there's just this, this kind of chasm between him and me. It's kind of like if you are deep in debt and insurmountable. You, you don't know how you can ever pay it back and all of a sudden you hear of some millionaire who's written the check and paid it off. You don't know who he is or maybe you, you learn his name at, at the, the bank telling you that your debt's been paid. But, and you're thankful because you don't have that debt anymore. But it's not a deep, profound gratitude because there's such a distance. There's not a relational connection between that debt being paid. And so too, we talk about salvation that way. Jesus has done so much for us and we're so thankful. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross. Thank you for forgiving us for, forgiving me of my sins. And we'll, I'll try to live for you. But there's still become, we talk about it in some sort of distant terms and even the way we live it out, we feel that distance, don't we? We feel that we try to live for him and, and yet we're, we're not sensing that intimate connection. But salvation in Christ, as the Bible describes it and as God intended it, as it truly is, is far more intimate than that. Jesus does not just send us a check in the mail for which we're thankful. Jesus comes to personally rescue us. He brings us to himself. He comes and takes on our very form enters into humanity so that we might be brought to his father so that we might be brought to fellowship with him forevermore and the spirit does the work of eternally bonding us to Christ a bond that is forever fused together a bond that can never be broken not by sin not by death not by the devil not by anything Now maybe you've been tracking with me thus far and you're going, wow, that's great. Sounds like a really cool theology lesson. What does that have to do with me? Why does it matter that I know this? Now hopefully you've already picked up some of the implications of it as I've spoken thus far, but there's really far-reaching implications to understanding our union with Jesus. For example, have you ever doubted your salvation? Doubted whether you're really saved. Doubted whether your sin maybe is proof that you, that you aren't a believer. Union with Christ teaches us that once we're united to the Son of God, we can't, that cannot be reversed. As I said earlier, nothing can break that bond. Have you ever felt that not much has changed in your, in your life since you were saved? Yes, there was maybe 
something significant that happened and you started going to church and there's some things that changed, but you know deep down you still feel a lot of that sin and corruption that's there in your heart and you're wondering, did anything significant actually happen? Union with Christ shows us that there have been amazing things that have taken place when we believed. The scriptures tell us that they have, even if we don't feel it. Have you ever felt like God is distant and unconcerned with your life? Like he's out there running and ruling the world and you've got your little problems and you feel like, does he really even take time and thought for me? Union with Christ reminds us that God and the person of his son could not have come any closer to us. Have you been tempted to think that the here and now physical world is more real than the spiritual one? To wonder as you're out there in the world and you're going about your daily business and your job or your school or home and neighborhood, whatever it is, and just life here in the world feels more real and tangible, like significant things are happening here, is, is the spiritual world, the things of Christ and the spirit and the gospel, are they, are they really significant? Are they really real? Are they really the greatest things? More real than what I see with my own eyes? Union with Christ reminds us to look with the eyes of faith to the truth of Scripture and to see that what took place in Christ is truth. And we seek to live by this truth rather than by our subjective feelings. We're going to take the month of August to dive deep into this doctrine of the union with Christ. So have four Sundays to explore this vital topic. Today, we're going to look at how union with Christ gives us a new identity. Next week, we'll look at how union with Christ is seen in the events of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and what that means for our salvation. In two weeks, we'll see how union with Christ plays out in our daily walk. Our union with Christ paves the way for communion with the triune God. In other words, union with Christ is something that should play out in our everyday and finally, we'll spend the last week of the month examining how union with Christ enables us to have union with one another, have fellowship within the body of Christ. To be in Christ means we're part of his body, part of his church, and we're going to explore that together. So the time that we have remaining today, let's look at how our union with Christ shapes our identity first aspect of this union with Christ that we'll look at, how it shapes our identity. And our, our union with Christ shapes our identity in two primary ways. The first that we'll look at this morning is that union with Christ confronts us. It confronts our identity. We are awash in a society that is teaching false views on everything. We're encouraged to believe falsehoods about those things that are most fundamental to our existence, such as why we're here, who made us, are we made, who are we, what is our purpose for living here? And if you're to survey the society as a whole, there's kind of this general, at least in America, there's this general spirituality uh, in which people believe that there's a higher power. They believe that there's some sort of deity who uh, put us here, they may say. But he's largely unconcerned with our lives, unless, of course, we need him. I mean, he's, he's somewhat seen as like a butler that is sent in there at our service, and when we ring the bell and we have help and we need help in our lives, that he comes running to us to help us. But otherwise, we push him to the side and say, you just stay over there in the corner. Generally, it's believed that God's desire for us as humanity is that we be nice people, that we be good people, we strive to do our best, that we seek to be kind and fair to one another. And that the goal of our life is simply to maximize happiness. We, the, the worst thing, the greatest uh, sin is to be sad and to be sad about yourself and so we need to simply be, uh, be on a life mission to be as happy with ourselves as we can and feel good about ourselves. 
And foundational to this view of God that is, permeates our society is a belief that all people are self-made autonomous individuals. This is so baked into our society. This is uh, part of the water that we swim in that, uh, that we are autonomous individuals. We can make our own decisions. This is baked into what it means to be American. We believe that we're the master of our lives. We're the master of our identities. We're the master of our religion. We can pick and pull from where we want to, make what seems best to us. Whatever makes us happy, that is the ultimate goal and the ultimate aim. And therefore, everything else can bend. And so, people see themselves as free and bound to no one. I am not obligated. I am not tied down to anybody. I am my master of my own life. Now, what happens when this view that is, that is so prevalent and is, is so common collides with the Bible's teaching of salvation in Christ? Well, it directly confronts it. It directly confronts it. Because, you see, God is not simply there as a therapeutic help to make people feel better about themselves. God wants all of us. He wants our complete selves and he's come, as we've been talking about, to unite all that we are to his son, Jesus Christ. Do you see how God as the butler doesn't fit with this idea of being united and fused to Jesus? He wants to make sinners his children by adoption. That's what God's about. Making sinners his children by adoption. And for the average Western individual, this is a little too close for comfort. I don't want God to get into all my business like that. I don't want him to be taking all of me. I don't want to surrender all that I am and all of my agenda for my life. I want to be in control. But this adoption is part of what it means that we get a new identity in Christ. We're adopted into the family through Jesus. We already read it. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 4 through 6 says, In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he blessed us in the beloved. We have been predestined for adoption to himself through Jesus Christ. But there's another passage that describes this adoption. If you flip to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, Paul further describes this adoption. Galatians 4, chapter 4, verse 4, says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Notice, first of all, do you see how all the persons of the Godhead are involved in this salvation? God, being the Father, sent forth his Son. And then, it says down in verse 6, that he sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts. Father, Son, and Spirit, the Trinity, the three persons of the Godhead, are all involved with our salvation. And in this case, as he describes, with our adoption. Our adoption would not be possible if it were not for a loving father, a sacrificial son, and a gracious spirit to make it all possible. But notice the identity change that Paul talks about here too. Verse 6. From a slave to a son. From a slave to a son. Verse 7 rather. So you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Believer, this is 
Part of the fundamental reality of our identity change is that we were a slave to sin. But because of God's electing grace and because of his conquering work in our hearts, we are no longer a slave. But now we are son of God. We are children of God. We have status. Why? Because we've been united to the one natural son of God. God has only one natural son and the rest of his children are all adopted. And we've all been adopted by being fused, by being united to that one natural son. And therefore, we are co-heirs with Christ. We are fellow heirs with him. We share in his inheritance because we are united to him. Believer, you have a new identity in Christ. You are a child of God. You are not a slave to your sins and to your passions and your desires. You have been set free from that. And you are now a child of the living God. And notice what this identity change affects. What's the evidence of it? Paul says in verse 6 that as the Spirit of God comes into us and applies that salvation to us, what results? We cry out in prayer. Intimate prayer is a direct result of the evidence of our union with Christ. When we've been united to Jesus, when we've been changed from slave to son, it results in passionate, intimate prayer to the living God. Because now God is no longer our judge that is looking to cast us aside and judge us. This is our Father. And so we speak to Him in intimate terms. We're family. And we love the Lord for His grace to us that He would bring this about in our lives. But the fact that we're adopted in Christ is indeed the greatest news. But in our natural state, it doesn't feel that way left to ourselves in our sin, to know that God has come to adopt us can feel too demanding and too costly. Author J. Todd Billings in his book Union with Christ, Reframing Theology and Ministry for the Church, adapts a parable from the Dutch philosopher Soren Kierkegaard that illustrates how God's adoption of sinners is an affront to their independence. I thought it was helpful. He He says, imagine a day laborer in a great kingdom. A guy working in a field, let's say, in a great kingdom. The day laborer never dreamed that the emperor knew he existed. Who then could consider himself indescribably favored just to be permitted to see the emperor once. Something he would relate to his children and grandchildren as the most important event of his life. But suppose the emperor did something unexpected. If the emperor sent for him and told him that he wanted him for his son, what then? Quite humanly, the day laborer would be more or less puzzled, a little self-conscious, and embarrassed by it. He would humanly find it very strange and bizarre that the emperor wanted to take, make a fool of him, make him the laughingstock of the whole city. Billings goes on to say, in this parable, the day laborer working in the countryside recognizes the high and exalted place of the emperor. An occasional encounter with the emperor would be delightful, enough so the laborer could keep his own comfortable life, could keep his friends, keep his identity, and yet have it embellished by the honor of the emperor. It would be a little favor that would make sense to the laborer. But what if the emperor wants to make him his own son? The prospect of adoption in this sense is an offense. It's too much closeness. It's the sort of closeness that requires giving up one's own identity. Yes, it is a high and exalted place to be the child of the emperor, the king of the land. But it's too high and exalted. Wouldn't he be the laughing stock? Wouldn't he lose all that is precious to him if he were to ascend to be the king's son? It would be wonderful if the king would send him some money or maybe a letter to cherish as a relic. But the king is asking for so much more. The king is asking to be more than an accessory to his identity. The king wants his full identity, his full entire life. He wants him to be exalted, the child of the king. Billings in his book, brings this illustration home for us. He says this, And so it is with God the King. 
Yet adoption by the king is such a radical notion, we resist it. We would rather have the occasional brush of God's presence or a relic of his solidarity with us so that God can be an appendage of our identity. But God wants more than that. He wants our lives, our adopted identity. By bringing us into the new reality of the Spirit, we can call out to God, Abba, Father, as adopted children united to Christ. Yet, there are few things more countercultural than this process of adoption. Losing your life for the sake of Jesus Christ. To find it in communion with the triune God. We, on our own, want a God that's a butler, that benefits our life, that's simply an add-on to our agenda. But in the gospel, God comes to adopt us as his own children. Through the Spirit, we surrender the lordship of our lives and we cast down our idols of independence and autonomy as we are united to the Lord of all the earth. And so I ask you this morning, as this reality of adoption in Christ confronts us, how does it confront you this morning? Are you united to Christ? Are you a child of the King? Do you know the closeness and intimacy of crying out, Abba, Father, to the Lord? Have you embraced Christ? The offer of the gospel is open to you this morning that you today can go home as an adopted child of God if you would repent of your sins and turn to Christ. Giving up, surrendering all that you hold dear for the sake of gaining Jesus Christ, communion with the triune God, and everlasting life. That's the greatest exchange that we can give. You see, you're not able to self-reform enough. You're not able to change yourself enough. There is a day of reckoning coming in which we all must give an account to our creator for how we have lived. And most importantly, the, the primary question will be, what did you do with my son? Did you trust and believe in Jesus Christ, my only son, whom I sent to earth? So I encourage you this morning, don't leave this campus without being certain that you are a child of the king. We've looked at the first way that union with Christ shapes our identity. Namely, it confronts us. Let's look secondly at the way that it dignifies us. The second way that union with Christ shapes our identity is that it dignifies us. And this is simply the other side of what we've looked at, right? We've looked at being adopted by Christ, adopted into the family. And when that happens, our, our story is really one of rags to riches. We've been exalted higher than we can imagine. One Puritan put it this way, he said, if believers are united unto Christ, then hence I gather that they are the most honorable and most excellent persons upon the face of the earth. They are Christ-united people. And friends, we are not brought into the family as second-class citizens. We are brought into the family as full-fledged co-heirs with Christ. We have a seat at the table. We saw in Galatians chapter 4, verse 7, that it says that we're no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, an heir through God. We are, friends, we are heirs with Christ. We are fellow heirs with him, and that inheritance that is prepared for us is beyond description. And the fact that God has prepared this for us, for those of us that don't deserve anything, shows the, that we are valued by God. And so we need to remember this morning as we look at union with Christ that we realize that there is value in us not because there is anything valuable in us but simply because we have been united to Jesus. And so I ask you, have, do you struggle to feel worthy? Have you struggled with thoughts of despair? If you, or do you wonder if you are loved? Oh Christian, look to your union with Christ. Christ. And realize that you have been elevated to the highest estate. One day faith will be sight. But now you can know the power of Christ in your life. Listen to Sinclair Ferguson give us some words of comfort and wisdom. 
as it relates to understanding our union with Christ. He says, the knowledge of our union with Christ provides us with great dignity. As I look at myself, I see failure, sin, sometimes shame and disgrace. But that is neither the ultimate nor the whole truth about me as a Christian. No, I am united to Christ, a joint heir of his riches, a child of God. Knowing this to be the real truth about me lends grace and power to my life. Oh, Christian, let it lend grace and power to your life this morning. Your union with Christ should shape how you think about yourself. More fundamental than, than being a citizen of this country, more fundamental than being a member of your family is the fact that you are a member with Christ, that you are united to him. And as you live out your union with Christ, you live out your full humanity. We were created to be in fellowship and communion with God, but sin distorted that. But through Christ, we're able to regain that and live out our purpose once again. Don't be defined by the world, your past, your family, or your own agenda. Be defined by Christ, the Son of God who came to join himself to you so you would be rescued from your sin and be eternally welcomed into the family of God. Friends, union with Christ, the most important doctrine you've never heard of. But we're going to study it this month as we look to see all that Christ has for us. And I trust that you will be enriched, that you'll be blessed as you look with eyes of faith upon the Savior who gave himself for you. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Oh, Father, we bow before you and we are humbled when we consider what Jesus has done for us what you have done for us, what you, the triune God, have accomplished. As we've looked at this morning, Lord, we were the unworthy, sinful, hell-deserving people. And yet, you looked upon us with love and with grace. And you predestined us and you chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Why, we'll never know, other than you decided to love us. Oh God, humble our hearts. Help us to delight in the close, intimate relationship that we have through Christ to you. We praise you this morning that we are able to know you, that our future is secure, that we are in Christ. And it's in his name we pray, amen.